Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. My name is Karandeep Singh. I'm an assistant professor of learning health sciences here at the University of Michigan. I'd like to extend you a warm welcome to the Learning Health Systems Collaboratory, which is convened by the University of Michigan Medical School's Department of Learning Health Sciences. The LHS Collaboratory serves as a hub for advancing interdisciplinary research and the development of learning health systems at the University of Michigan and beyond. Prior to 2020, the LHS Collaboratory was convened in person and pulled together attendees from across our campus. Since 2020, we've been convening virtually, which has had the advantage of extending the reach of our collaboratory well beyond the walls of campus. Today, I'm very excited to welcome you to our session on the role of artificial intelligence within learning health systems. When we think about the learning health cycles within an LHS, AI is increasingly being used to identify high-risk patients to whom we can target interventions in an adaptive way. But how do we determine whether these AI-driven interventions actually work? The rigor with which research on AI-driven interactions is conducted and reported will have a large part to play in knowing what AI technologies are actually worth implementing. Once we know an AI system works in a research environment, how do we go about adapting or adopting these AI interventions while faced with the challenges of real world implementation? A few housekeeping notes, um, and then I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, first of all, this session is being recorded. Uh, the recording link will be shared with all attendees and registrants. This session will be live closed captioned. And as we go through the speakers, feel free to post questions in the Zoom Q&A uh, feature throughout the session. So you're welcome to use chat, but for questions that you wanna uh, address during the Q&A section, uh, please post those in Q&A. And we'll have a moderated Q&A after both of the speakers have had a chance to speak. So with the questions in mind that we talked about, you know, rigor in research, rigor in implementation, I'm really excited to introduce our two speakers who will touch on and address these questions. Dr. Xiao Lu uh, is a specialty trainee in ophthalmology in the West Midlands Deanery and a clinical researcher at the University of Birmingham and University Hospitals Birmingham NHS Foundation uh, Trust in the United Kingdom. She has done seminal work in developing reporting standards for machine learning interventions in clinical studies. She co-led the Spirit AI and Concert AI initiatives, which are new report, international reporting standards for the reporting of AI-driven clinical trials. Then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Alan Karthikasalingam, who is the senior staff clinical research scientist in Google Health, who leads the clinical team's translational research efforts with a particular focus on bridging new machine learning developments in health-oriented research and AI safety. He's an honorary lecturer in vascular surgery at Imperial College in London, where he continues to see patients and supervise PhD students. In 2017, he joined DeepMind's health research team and then transitioned over to Google Health in 2019. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed articles, including landmark, recent landmark papers in Nature and Nature Medicine, on the use of deep learning systems for mammography, ophthalmology, and electronic health records. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Liu. Um, and so we'll hear from her, and then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Karthikas Lingam, um, and then we'll do a moderated Q&A. So please remember throughout, feel free to ask questions uh, and take a look at what questions other, others have asked. Xiao, take it away. Hi, um, thanks Karadeep for the introduction and great to be here today. Um, hi everybody, it's afternoon here in the UK, good morning uh, in the States. So uh, as Karandeep says, uh, my background is I'm a clinician scientist. I work on making sure that AI in healthcare can be safe, effective and fair. Um, and the focus of my talk today is going to be around the evidence standards that underpins AI and healthcare, making sure that we uh, have robust evidence to support uh, those attributes of AI that we're implementing for our patients. So um, just before I kind of get into the weeds of the evidence, I find it quite helpful to maybe just step back for a second and contextualize 
the state of play as we are today. Um, and we, what we're now looking at is several hundreds of regulatory approved AI or ML enabled medical devices, which are available on the market um, for, for hospitals and for healthcare providers to purchase and implement in their healthcare systems. Um, so last I checked on the FDA database, there are over 340 um, of these medical devices that are now approved. And in fact, this hasn't been updated since 2021. So almost certainly there are more now. And in the EU um, and the UK, we don't have uh, quite as good uh, of a database to, to monitor the availability of these devices. So we've had to rely on the academic literature and commercial databases, but uh, as of 2020, there have been at least 240 of these algorithms that have been available on the market in, in the EU um, for implementation into healthcare systems. So um, there was a time when I was giving this sort of talk on evidence standards and actually uh, a lot of the implications were quite theoretical, but um, in, in the last year or two, there's certainly been a huge expansion of the number of tools that are actually uh, becoming piloted or implemented in the healthcare system. And something that I've been learning over the last few years is trying to get my head around the regulatory system that governs these um, algorithms as medical devices. Um, so we're very familiar with the, the way that we evaluate drugs. We have phase one to four trials um, and typically to achieve market approval and be able to be sold or used in patients, you have to have conducted a phase three trial, which typically is a prospective, um, usually randomized trial in patients where you have to essentially demonstrate the effectiveness of a drug um, compared to standard treatment or compared to a, a placebo. And you have to demonstrate you know, non-inferiority or superiority to an existing standard. And in medical devices, um, this kind of phase response is less well defined. Um, but in this paper, there was a comparison to the different phases that we see in drugs. So in the phase one, it might be that you, you know, develop your algorithm and perform some initial testing under very controlled, um, so under very controlled settings. In phase two, you might test out your algorithm using a separate um, data set that you acquire from elsewhere, and you could consider that an external validation of your algorithms, which typically gives you a better idea of how well those results are likely to generalize in the real world. And then the phase three um, equivalent for a medical device uh, might be using it for the first time in patients. And you might, rather than looking at, um, rather than focusing on performance as a key metric of how well that algorithm's working, you might begin to look at things like, well, how does this impact care? What are the outcomes that um, affect patients? And usually these are done sort of in real world settings where, you know, rather than testing on data sets, you're actually testing on patient samples. And then the phase four, um, like with drugs, is a sort of ongoing performance monitoring, making sure that the safety signals stay um, above, uh, uh, below the threshold or above the threshold that you anticipate and you're not getting too many adverse events. And the critical difference here is that with algorithms or with, um, with ML systems as medical devices, so far, in order to enter the market, you haven't needed to do that phase three trial because the regulators haven't asked for it. And so many of those devices within that 300 or so that are approved by the FDA and in the EU were able to enter the market based on phase two trial equivalents only. So demonstrating a performance um, in data sets only. And that approach has been criticized in the academic literature because what we know is that these algorithms, once they are deployed into a real life clinical pathway, and once you, uh, once you put it into the messiness that is a clinical world and um, considering all the, kind of, uh, all the kind of implementation factors, the cute computer, uh, the human computer interface and the interactions, that actually all of these factors can contribute to that algorithm not working as well as you might think on a nice, clean, isolated data set. 
And I know that um, that uh, well, I'm hoping that Al uh, Alan's going to talk a bit about uh, about this a little bit in his talk as well about some of the situations where actually you can't get a true representation of the performance of these AI systems until you deploy them in a prospective trial. And also, rather than looking at performance alone, i.e. accuracy, um, to look at the effect on patient outcomes or outcomes that matter to patients in the health system. So we, we have considered the evidence gap um, quite early on, sometime around 2018, we were doing a systematic review um, which looked at the uh, diagnostic accuracy of the sort of state-of-the-art deep learning systems at the time across a whole host of uh, medical um, diseases in imaging. And we wanted to get an idea of how well that compared to clinicians. And this was one of the first times uh, that uh, researchers had done meta-analysis to make that kind of head-to-head -head comparison. And we looked at a huge number of studies, something like over 22,000 studies published at the time, lots of them published in really high impact journals, making really impressive claims about how these algorithms are able to match the performance or outperform humans. But what we actually found was that only a very small portion of those studies were done in a robust enough way that we could include them in our meta-analysis. And it was less than 1% of the studies overall, in fact. And what we also found was that there were loads of issues with the reporting of the methods and the results um, of these studies, which meant that actually it was really difficult to make a judgment as to whether the findings would be generalizable in the real world. And often there were really basic things that were just not described or not provided enough detail. Um, things that you would you know, expect in a drug trial, like the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the participants and the, the, um, the, the data, um, the way that the data was split and handled and all those things. And shortly after, um, in 2020, um, two other systematic reviews were published looking at similar things. So um, one that uh, looked at diagnostic imaging um, and the diagnostic accuracy of those using deep learning, and another looking at um, specifically looking at some of the design and methodological elements of studies that um, use deep learning for uh, prediction and prognostic modeling. And they found very similar things. So at that point, there was relatively few uh, prospective studies. Very few of these were being done on what we would call an external validation, where you have um, a completely separate data set uh, with which you test the performance and make the performance claims. And um, in fact, there was relatively uh, low sort of lack of rec recognition that we really needed prospective studies. Um, and only a small percentage of these studies actually made the claim that, well, we need prospective studies going forward and we need randomized trials. So then last year, um, we saw this uh, systematic review come out, which suggests that randomized control trials are, are beginning to appear and some of them are coming through now with results. So this review identified 65 RCTs so far um, that use AI as part of its prediction tool. Uh, but we continue to see some other reporting and methodological issues that we found before. Um, so in their risk of bias assessment across these 65 studies, what the authors noted was that more than half were um, either unclear or high risk of bias. And often when you see kind of these really large proportions of studies that have unclear risk of bias, it's usually because the reporting's not been done clearly enough and transparently enough that you as a reader can have enough information to judge whether there is a risk of bias or not. And the other thing that was really striking that this review commented was that in these 65 RCTs, two fifths of the tools that achieved good performance in those earlier studies, so in those kind of phase two equivalent studies, um, where they showed good, uh, good uh, accuracy, actually failed to demonstrate clinical benefit for patients compared to routine clinical treatment. 
And this is the, tr the true value of these prospective trials is that it allows you to not only look at the performance of the algorithm, but it allows you to measure outcomes that actually matter to the patients um, so that you can get a sense of whether these algorithms, even the most accurate ones, whether they have actual utility in clinical practice or not. So what's our contribution to closing the evidence gap? Um, Karen Deep already alluded to this. So you know, we need really good evidence in order to make judgments about these things. And just like every other health intervention, um, AI should be underpinned by robust evidence. And by that, I mean, you know, we need a good, quest good questions that are um, relevant, that meet a, uh, an actual clinical need. Um, we need good study design um, that can mitigate for potential sources of bias and confounding. And we need really good reporting. There's no point doing a really great uh, clinical trial and then reporting it badly. You're just undoing the good work, right? Um, and by good reporting, what we mean is it should be truthful. Um, it should be replicable by others. It should be in sufficient detail that you can actually replicate it theoretically. And it should be understandable to the audience that, um, that is reading the paper. And so a really useful tool that has been used for a number of years is reporting guidelines. Um, what a reporting guideline is, is essentially a checklist along with some explanatory text that specifies the minimum content that's needed when you are reporting a study or writing up your paper that summarizes the study. What a reporting guideline does, or what, rather, what a reporting guideline doesn't do is tell you how you should conduct your study. All it asks is that you describe what you did. So it's a purely descriptive thing. And um, many reporting guidelines sit under the Equator Network, which is an international uh, collaborative effort to improve the, uh, the transparency and completeness of reporting in the medical literature. And there are a number of reporting guidelines that are used really widely for different study designs. So the ones that people are generally most familiar with are the PRISMA guidelines for systematic reviews and the consort guidelines for randomized trials. Um, and what's great about these is that it, at the peer review stage, when you're submitting a paper, um, you, you will be asked by the journal to lay out your study in accordance to a reporting guideline. So you'll have a checklist and that will say, you know, please include X, Y, Z, and you will tick off these things um, and say on which page you have, um, you have adhered to these reporting items. And it's helpful because this puts the authors, the peer reviewers and the editors at the manuscript submission stage on an equal playing field. And particularly for you know, new areas of research like AI, where, um, where you know, not, not every uh, peer reviewer may be familiar with the technical aspects, it's really useful to have these checklists um, which set out essentially what the minimum information you need to require are. And so um, for clinical trials, we have SPIRIT, which is standard reporting items uh, for uh, interventional trials with, uh, for a protocol. And we also have CONSORT, which um, is the reporting guideline for a clinical trial report. So one is, this is what we're going to do, and um, spir uh, SPIRIT is what we're going to do, and CONSORT is, this is what we did. And what people have done over the years as we've had new interventions or new study designs come through um, with specific considerations that aren't met by these generic guidelines is that we've developed extensions to uh, guidelines like SPIRIT and CONSORT to address those very specific needs. And so this is what we did with SPIRIT and CONSORT AI. We uh, added extensions of AI specific considerations um, for each of these, uh, for trials that are evaluating AI interventions. So in the next couple of minutes in this talk, I'm going to very quickly whiz through kind of the headliners of the items that we added. But I just want to caveat that with a couple of things. Um, one is not to forget that these items sit on top of a list of generic items. And so, 
you know, things that you might consider in a randomized trial, like your randomization, your sample size, the way you blinded the patients of each arm, uh, those are things that you have to report for any um, randomized trial. But what the uh, AI extension items do is sit on top of that as additional considerations. The other point I want to make is that um, what I've included here is just the headlines of each of these uh, reporting items. And in the main papers and also on our website that they are accompanied by longer explanatory text, which contextualizes the items and also provides some examples. Um, so if you're ever needing to use Spirit AI on console AI or, or even the generic guidelines, I'd highly recommend looking at the explanatory text as well, um, because sometimes just reading the title alone can lead to misunderstanding of what they're actually asking for. So um, in the title and abstract, we ask the author to really simple specify that the intervention involves an AI or ML component. And this is purely so that it's really clear, um, even sort of when you're searching just title and abstracts, so if you're doing a review or so, or so on, that um, what we're dealing with here is a clinical trial that evaluates a ML or AI intervention. We also ask for a brief description of the intended use of the algorithm in the abstract and a longer explanation of this in the introduction. Um, and the language that we use here is very specifically chosen to align with the regulatory language of the intended use statement. And so what that would involve is um, describing what the algorithm or what the intervention is for, who it's for, who should be using it, who the users are, um, and what in what kind of clinical pathway and what kind of clinical context. And these are the types of information that you would have to supply um, in your regulatory documents as well. So we purposefully um, look to align. In the methods section, there, um, is, uh, there are two items that ask you to state the inclusion and exclusion criteria at the level of the participants, as you normally would in a clinical trial. But additionally, also to state that um, at the level of the input data. So this would be the data that you present to the AI or that's sort of ingested by the algorithm in order to produce an output. Um, and this is recognizing that often uh, the quality of the data and you know, certain attributes of the data can affect performance of the algorithms and actually often the um, exact specifications of the input data um, uh, should be should be sort of outlined very clearly so that it can be replicated. We ask the authors to describe how the AI intervention was integrated into the trial setting, um, including if they have any on-site or off-site requirements. Again, this is to um, ensure that these integration, these implementation considerations don't uh, affect the performance of the algorithm if you're trying to replicate this in future different trial sites or you know future trial or in, in real use. And we also ask um, for a statement of which version the algorithm was used uh, in the trial, recognizing that um, like many other software, we'll have multiple versions and updates, the algorithms, and we need to know which version it was that was uh, assessed in the tr in this trial. Um, and we also recommend, again, like trying to align with regulatory guidance to um, use a regulatory marking like a unique device identify, um, ident identifier if one is available. There are a set of items around the input data, so how um, the data was acquired and selected, uh, how poor quality or unavailable data was handled, and also describing whether there are any human AI interaction components in the handling of that data and whether you know, um, the users require certain training or expertise in order to um, perform that function. Um, and this is to reach, uh, this is to uh, de clearly demarcate where the essentially the function of the algorithm stops and the human system around it begins. Um, so that you know, if it produces a wrong output, you can try and work out, is it the algorithm that went wrong or actually is it the way that it was used that, was, uh, that went wrong? There's a specific item around the reporting of performance errors um, and how these errors were identified. Um, and this item was specifically around recognizing that these algorithms sometimes produce really unpredictable and unexpected and unhuman errors 
which uh, may not be obvious if you're just looking for an aggregate performance of, you know, a certain percentage of accuracy. And that also actually that these errors may have a tendency to repeat themselves um, in, a, in a way that may be preventable if, if they are essentially audited. And if you try and get down to the bottom of why they happen in the first place. And in fact, this item alone has sparked uh, uh, a, a second piece of work, um, which we published recently called the Medical Algorithmic Audit. Um, this, was a this was kind of uh, something that we wanted to do to put out some guidances around how you might do this kind of performance uh, error analysis and how you might go about looking, looking for different failure modes. So um, that's just something that we published off the back of that. And then the last item is a statement around how the AI intervention and its code can be accessed, um, including any restrictions to access or, or reuse, just making that, um, making that information available for the reader. And so these guidelines were published um, in October 2020. Um, we published it simultaneously in three journals, Nature Medicine, The Lancet and the BMJ. And since then, um, it's been adopted by many of the ma main medical journals. Um, we have seen them appear in the instructions to authors, and we've seen a number of journals um, specifically ask for them when, um, when studies are submitted. Um, and they've also been endorsed by a number of uh, sort of UK-based, but also international regulatory bodies um, and health policy uh, forums um, that includes our main regulator in the UK, which is the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRA, um, as well as the FDA um, and other groups like the WHO um, focus groups on AI and health. Um, and this is just uh, like a slightly surreal photograph of the uh, consensus meeting that we held in January 2020, um, shortly before everyone got locked down. And didn't see each other again for two years. Um, and, I, and this is really just uh, to say thank you for the, the group of people that contributed to this. And of course, what's not shown in this photograph is the over 100 or so participants that we had feeding into our Delphi study, our main consensus study, which took place over about six months in, in a number of different stages. Um, and it you can access the uh, checklist in probably, I think the most intuitive way on our website. And we, we have templates and things for filling out um, the, the checklist itself. Um, but we embedded each of the item, the AI extension items uh, within the um, backdrop of the original spirit and consort guidelines. So if you're interested in that, um, you can find it clinical-trials.ai. And something that we are working on now is translating the guidelines uh, into different languages. And we, um, this is a, sort of an open invitation for anyone who might be interested in that. We have a process for how we do translation and we do backwards and forwards translation to make sure the content doesn't change. Um, so this is just an invitation if anyone is interested in that. And I also want to highlight a number of other upcoming guidelines for other study designs. Um, which will be, I think, hopefully published later on this year. So STARD AI is the reporting guideline for diagnostic accuracy studies of AI, uh, which is something that both I and Alan are involved with. Uh, this is almost in the final, final stages of being written up now. Tripod AI is the same thing, but for prediction and prognostic models um, and is being uh, led by the original Tripod group from, um, from Oxford. And uh, Decide AI is a slightly new one, so it's not an extension, it's a brand new guideline for um, uh, those early phase studies where you're testing the feasibility of these algorithms and looking at specifically at things like human AI interaction. And that one will be published very shortly too. And my last slide, I just want to highlight some work that um, our team is working on now. So this uh, is the Standing Together program, which is around uh, particularly focusing on the data that underpins AI technologies and around uh, building technologies that can be fair and equitable. Um, and I won't spend too much on this now. If you want more information on it, it's on uh, datadiversity.org. But essentially from our work, 
looking at some of the data sets that are used to train and test these algorithms, something that we became quite concerned about was that the relative disproportionate representation of geographies and different people groups within these data sets. And there is, a, um, there is uh, evidence to show that underrepresentation of certain populations can lead to underperformance of these algorithms. And in order to build um, a AI enabled healthcare system in an equitable way, we really need data sets that can um, build technologies that don't leave the minoritized few behind. So that's something that we will be working on over the next few years. And lastly, just thank you very much for listening. Um, I will hand over um, to Alan now, and here are some of the links to the things that I talked about and my email, but I will pop these in the chat as Alan's talking. Thank you. All right. Um, so thanks everyone for putting questions in the Q&A. Um, I've been tracking those and we'll kind of keep an eye on those as well. Um, thanks again to Xiao and Alan for your wonderful presentations. Um, I think it, we'll start off with kind of questions. Um, and I wanted to start off actually with a question that Xiao had answered in chat, which was related to a question by uh, Chuck Friedman around versioning of models. So Chuck, do you want to reflect on kind of your question, uh, Xiao's response? Um, so this is actually, uh, so before I turn it over to Xiao and Alan, maybe Chuck can unmute and kind of share your, uh, share the question in a little bit more detail and kind of your follow-up. Uh, sure. Uh, Xiao, Alan, uh, thank you. Thank you just so much, uh, for these presentations, which were, were absolutely superb and I'm sure, uh, thought provoking for all of us, uh, who are uh, here with you today. And it is a very large group. Uh, speaking from my own personal experience that go back uh, a while, uh, th there is a uh, question about whether these kinds of prospective trials are a viable model uh, for, uh, for uh, ultimately regulating uh, AI and ML uh, algorithms uh, because of the time it takes to complete these studies and the fact that these models will continue to evolve over the time that studies are uh, actually conducted. And putting myself in the role of a reader of, of one of the studies, uh, Shao, of the kind that you um, described, um, if I know at the time that I uh, read one of these reports, uh, and because Consort AI has required the authors to stipulate uh, which version, uh, say version 5.0, was, uh, 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 was the version studied, that there exists a version 7.0 or 8.0 uh, that presumably is better, or at least more recent, uh, developed with more recent data than the one that's been tested. What's a reader to do um, in this situation? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question, so uh, that's why I put it to you. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the answer either. Maybe we can have a discussion about it. I think it's really challenging, isn't it? Um, particularly for those use cases which are looking at diseases with a really long um, trajectory. So particularly in some of the cancer screening studies, we're looking at clinical trials that can go on for years in order to find enough positive cases. And I, th I, I think that is a very real challenge. Um, the, what, the answer that I put in the chat was a kind of a combination of multiple mechanisms that might help. I, I, I've come across studies before where the developer have proposed that, you know, they continue to change the version of the algorithm or they continue to change the algorithm in some way, even in the duration of the trial. And that becomes very difficult to evaluate because what they sometimes propose is that, well, we're learning from the users um, as we set off in the first six months or the first year of the trial and and we were able to make this better and that this is then representative of how we're going to implement this tool in real life but then the results that you um, accrue during that time um, you are unable to really separate out uh, the the effects of, of that the effects on the results of, of that change so then it becomes very very difficult um, so 
I don't know for 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 sure to be honest um I think it has to be in multiple mechanisms maybe um around having clarity of what uh, version was in the trial originally um what ver what version we are now um trying to evaluate now presuming sometime in the future um maybe some sort of description of what the change was and whether we consider it a significant change or not and what data you have to support that the performances maintains at an equivalent stage you know what populations you looked at and the new test data whether it is truly comparable and then once you look at the sort of post implementation stage to recognize that there may be a degree of uncertainty because we are now looking at a new version and to have really robust mechanisms for monitoring safety. Um, yeah. So I'll share some thoughts then. I, I'm going to pose a related question to Alan to get his thoughts on this. But, um, you know, to me, I think, uh, Chuck, the issue you raise is are you validating a model or a modeling approach? Um, because if your model, you know, if your interest is in a specific model, then you're right, you're kind of stuck. And, you know, the assumption that you're making is the next model is, you know, in some way divorced from the first one. And so you have to start from scratch. But if you're validating a modeling approach, then what you're really trying to say is, is the steps I'm following to build this model and link it to an intervention, an effective way to do things. In which case, if the model changes halfway through, it changes halfway through. So in our, we had done a randomized control trial where we used a model to identify high risk patients and then randomize them to a, um, care coordination intervention. This is the state innovation model project. And in that project, every two months, the model was updated. So that was the approach. Um, so, you know, we weren't really hanging our hat on any given version of that model being the right one, but repeating that approach and updating it every two months, you know, was, uh, the idea was we're trying to validate that approach. Uh, so I guess uh, the related question I have for you, Alan, is, you know, on your one of your first slides, uh, you showed Google Inbox, which, as you know, uh, went into the sunset in 2019. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as happens with a lot of products, things kind of come and go from the market. Um, and so, I guess, how do you? What is your take on versioning and the work that you do? Um, and then, then you know, um, and how do you deal with things kind of coming and going in the health space? Because uh, there is a lot of dynamic nature to this. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a really good uh, difference. It's a really important difference between consumer technology and medical technology, uh, and it's um, you know it's really worth kind of calling out, which is that I think there's a big difference between things that are regulated medical devices and things that are not. So you know, in the broader space of, for example, wellness, um, or even if if one thinks about um, you know, uh, for example, things that can, can still have, you know, profound public health impacts in terms of technology and machine learning. So consider, for example, um, authoritative information, uh, the ability, you know, if someone says searching on Google for information about where a COVID vaccine might be available near them or co a COVID testing site, you know, local to them. Uh, again, you know, there may be many applications of AI that can help that user. And in that sort of setting, Clearly, there's a very different approach to sort of the versioning and serving of sort of updated models, uh, as compared because you know that that's not a, a setting in which there's a regulated medical device uh, uh, involved or direct kind of patient care per se. I think it's very different if we think about the provision of like, uh, for example, like something like the diabetic retinopathy classifier, which we were discussing earlier, where you know many of those things are in the US and in Europe and in the UK, at least a class two medical device. And there, the regulators have very robust approaches around how change control works, um, whether those changes are classified as minor uh, minor changes in under the regulatory framework or major. And basically, there's a, a sort of set series of things that have to be sort of resubmitted to the regulator, depending on what the nature is of those changes. So I think it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's very much down to the situation, but where we're talking about sort of diagnostic tools, I think it's really um, important that, you know, but basically these like rigorous processes of model updates that are required by regulators have to be followed because um, there are otherwise, the, you know, all sorts of potential unforeseen uh, consequences.
there's similarly a, ra a raft of things around post market surveillance um, that also you know have to be followed very carefully and those are typically tagged to the same reason for the sort of version control that it can be attributed to a particular product essentially um, Thanks, Al. Um, so Diane Harper asks a couple of different really related, I think makes a couple of related points and asks some great questions around diagnostic uncertainty. So I think she makes the point that pathologists, for example, uh, when they're looking at cervical cytology, they only have a 50% sensitivity. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in images and how experts view images. And I think you showed that in your ophthalmologist slide where, you know, when you look at a number of different ophthalmologists, the same film, you know, they, they, they look at it differently. So I'll ask one question, then I think I'll kind of pose the follow-up that, that Diane asked, which is when you have conflicting labels from multiple experts, how do you present that to the algorithm? Do you present the, you know, um, consensus as if it was the gold standard, or do you actually present the human uncertainty to the model in some way so that it can recognize that there was a split here among experts? I think we've done I've done a number of different things um, depending on the context and the clinical task. So um, one example, I mean, I think the ideal thing is to be able to, of course, find some reliable and objective measure of disease. Um, and noting that that information may not actually be in the image. Um, so, for example, in the setting of breast, you know, uh, breast cancer screening, there there are some sort of very reliable uh, clinical data sets in which the ground truth of sort of uh, cancer development within a particular screening interval um, has been collected with really rigorous follow-up just by the patient having been observed after the fact. Um, and that's the case in, for example, you know, some of the Cancer Research UK data sets and, and other uh, large data sets. So that's really helpful. And that means, you know, in the absence of a radiologist, for example, being able to authoritatively make a comment on the image, or perhaps even an AI system, you know, um, a tumor may simply have not been present at the time, Nonetheless, the later development of cancer, along with later images, can be can be kind of brought to bear. Where that sort of thing is not possible, um, there's a lot of different things that can be done. I think one thing is paying meticulous attention to the way in which labeling is done. And this means using kind of proper tools for the purpose, thinking about the labeling protocols that are used and iterating those with kind of an attention to the kappa you know, variation between the labelers and ensuring those converge. Even after that, if there's variation, there's differences between, for example, consensus uh, between experts versus adjudication, like actually having a subspecialist try to adjudicate. And that can be done with or without a panel of original experts, you know, with or without giving them the opportunity to sort of resolve that consensus. And again, there's kind of published methods that can be used to try and, you know, um, resolve that, like mini versions of that Delphi thing that Zhao was presenting earlier. Um, where all of that's also not possible and where sometimes, you know, the image itself is, can be extremely ambiguous, like in the setting of teledermatology, where just a lot of the relevant information may simply not be present. You know, you can't palpate a teledermatological lesion. You can't necessarily ask if it's itchy or see other parts of the body and, and other important things or ask about family history. Then in those settings, I think, you know, using uh, approaches to probabilistic ground truth is probably the best thing that can be done along with, again, you know, the appropriate level of humility uh, at evaluation time and just being careful to make sure that, you know, if the label that's, that's associated with a particular image is not certain, then it should be treated as such, um, I think. I think you also partly touched on one of Diane's other questions, which was her main question, which was, I think, uh, potential role of biomarkers. Basically, when the information you need isn't entirely in the image, there's other factors that might be contributing, you know, um, biologically. How do you combine those? And I think w w one thing you touched on was that in your database, with, uh, you know, for cancer progression, you're not just using the image to decide if it progressed. You're actually looking at the clinical picture um, and kind of outcomes that happen. Um, are you doing multimodal work where you're combining images with other stuff? Yeah, I think that's right. I think, yeah, we're talking just about evaluation there. I think another really exciting frontier is exactly that, like, um, you know, the ability to sort of, even that kind of contrastive learning example I gave earlier for dermatology, I mean, that was contrastive learning between two images. It's also, of course, possible to do the same thing with um, natural language, you know, sound um, and other kind of 
types of input. And I think um, I think that's a really exciting area actually for medical AI research. Thanks. So, so Xiao, you touched on, you know, and I think some of the questions in chat have or had touched on this as well, which was, you know, how has the uptake been? I think you shared the uptake for Spirit AI, Concert AI across journals, across regulators, but in terms of research studies coming out, you know, that claim that, that say that, yes, we adhere to, or we followed the, you know, these reporting guidelines, you know, how compliant are they with those reporting guidelines um, and kind of, you know, are we starting to see some of those reporting uh, improvements or is it more that you've codified some of the best practices and so we're just seeing less variation or it's too soon to tell because these were just published? Yeah, um, that's really interesting. I, I think there's uptake and then there's kind of impact as well. So I, I think the uptake generally has been really good um, in the sense that a lot of the gatekeepers of the medical literature and uh, health policy bodies have begin to point towards these guidelines as best practice so at least you know people are, are aware of them and and they will make efforts to adhere to them but I think the, the impact question is is more tricky and um, and to be fair we haven't looked across the board at the you know recently published um, RCTs since this, these were published in 2020 um, some may adhere to the guidelines or or adhere to them in the way that they think they're supposed to and misunderstand um, what the item's already asking. And really, it does depend a little bit on the editors and the peer reviewers that are supposed to be checking uh, for proper adherence of the guidelines. And, and I've been that peer reviewer before and looked at papers where the, the items have been misunderstood or you know it's been obvious that they've just Look, read the title, but not the explanatory text. So, so that's a bit trickier, and it does depend on us having um, editors and reviewers that they themselves really understand the guidelines. I think we're 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 kind of just on the cusp of having about three other guidelines that align really well to some of the things that we recommend in Spirit and Console AI, and particularly Starred and Tripod. Um, which are the other Equator network endorsed ones. We've been working really closely with um, the teams that have been leading those to make sure that we are putting forward a common message and using the same terminology. And I think that once these are published, we may begin to see a lot of um, these recommendations just become common practice because essentially there's the same message coming from, from all directions. Um, but, you know, since the guidelines were published in recent years, the general community has become more switched on to some of these issues. So it's also a bit difficult to untangle, you know, how much of it was attributable to the guidelines or how much of it is just us being more clued up as to what robust evidence looks like now. Yeah, and that's a great point. I think, you know, in, for example, with tripod guidelines, one of the biggest challenges has been that, you know, folks follow the tripod guidelines, but that doesn't mean they made good analytical decisions. Um, you know, I think the purpose of the guidelines, as you mentioned, is really to bring the quality of this science to light into, into transparency, whereas previously you might not have mentioned how you handled missing data. Now you have to mention what you did with it, and you might have done the totally wrong thing, wrong thing with it, but at least by mentioning it, you know, folks can have a better, you know, be better judges of the quality of the work. Um, so yeah, I think it may take time for impact to happen because, um, so do, do you have an elaboration paper for that? Or like, I know the tripod has an expl explanation elaboration paper. Is there one like that for concert AI or spirit AI? So, um, we haven't published an elaboration paper yet. Um, the way that many of these guidelines have been published in the past is you have the checklist published first and the paper that describes how this checklist was essentially formed. And then usually about a year or so down the line, um, the, the groups will publish a much longer uh, E&E &E paper, explanation, elaboration paper. And those are actually fantastic um, resources for, for learning as well. Um, so, I mean, I learned a huge amount from the tripod E&E &E paper. Um, but when we put out the spirit and consort statements in 2020, we didn't feel comfortable with just putting the headlines. And I think our gut instinct was correct because of, you know, some of these misinterpretations that we've seen. So we, we, we did a kind of halfway house where we put some explanatory text alongside each item. 
And I think at some time in the future, maybe in the next year or so, we will look at doing um, a much longer e and &E paper as more examples come through and we can start pulling up good examples of exemplar and bad examples of work. So, so this is a question, I wanna meld two different questions uh, in the Q&A uh, and, and pose this to both of you. This is a, a questions I'm melding come from uh, Behadin Irakchi, sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, and Dr. Uh, James Wollescroft. Uh, and, and the questions I think both have to do with the idea of models updating, models performing differently in different settings because of different maybe baseline probabilities of an event um, and kind of how that plays out with terms of regulation. So I guess my question to you is, you know, um, given the fact that things may perform differently over time, things may be updated and things may be, um, may perform differently across places, even like institutions or settings. Um, to what extent can these kinds of technologies be centrally regulated or governed? Or is, you know, it, does it have to be some mix of centralized and distributed governance? I know Nicholson Price wrote a paper on this and he's an attendee right now. Um, so if we can un-attendee him, I'd love to hear his thoughts too, but, but um, uh, Shower or, or, or Alan, you know, thoughts on regulation from a, you know, centralized versus distributed and how the, you know, the, the time and place issues play into that. Um, so, I mean, my, my thoughts on this are, are slightly mixed. You know, we've had this conversation before, Karen Deep as well, around local validation being kind of perhaps more important um, given the tendency for these algorithms to be misbehave when you deploy in local settings. But I, I, I do also you know, sympathize with the regulators in that there has to be some kind of central oversight. Um, but the other approach, which I think is really important that we are not doing very well yet is being able to carry out local uh, post-deployment monitoring of safety signals and then having a really watertight feedback loop, uh, both lo on a local level, but also with the regulators. And I think we're very focused at the moment on pre-specifying change control plans and reaching a stage where, you know, pre-deployment, we are happy with the performance, the generalizability, and, and, then, and then, you know, getting to a point where we can go hands off and we feel that the safety signal, but actually, we can we can oscillate on the amount of risk that we can tolerate on that by having more and more watertight um, post deployment monitoring strategies. So I think maybe that is an area that we need to focus uh, much more on right now. I think it's uh, a really good point. Like in if you compare to kind of um, medical hardware devices, like consider you know uh, stent grafts for example in vascular surgery, there's a combination of central requirements for post-market surveillance and monitoring and of course device registries and so on but there are also um, much more sort of real-time and distributed um, community-led efforts to monitor for safety signals um, divide you know uh, national registries for example in the uk have helped and in the us have helped flag very early issues with medical devices quickly um, so yeah i think um, I kind of completely empathize with the need for central standards of post-market surveillance. Um, but I think there's a really great opportunity actually, particularly for clinician society specialists locally and local level to uh, provide much more sort of real-time signal for what's actually happening. Um, so probably there's the answer is both uh, is, is what I imagine happens to, with most technology. Certainly that's been the case with hardware devices in, in surgery anyway. Excellent. Um, Nicholson, do you mind introducing yourself and uh, you know sharing your thoughts on regulation? I know you've published in JAMA, published uh, in, in other settings kind of on the topic of both regula regulatory limitations, but also this idea of centralized versus distributed uh, governance. Yeah, of course. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Oops, no, my video is, well, I can't make, put it on, so that's all right. Um, that's what I look like in a still photo. Uh, uh, so I teach at the law school here at the University of Michigan and think about these issues. And on the on the regulated versus distributed governance side, the issue that I think is, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm really in agreement with uh, Shouse and Alan's point about there being the need for a blend. Um, 
what strikes me as the really problematic, uh, not, not orthogonal, but related issue here is the question of capacity to do that sort of localized governance. Right? I was really happy to hear in both of your talks uh, points about making sure that these uh, uh, products are available in different clinical workflows in different settings uh, with different patient populations. Um, and it strikes me that that distributed governance role to the extent we need local validation uh, is going to be especially hard to get right in exactly the places that we might worry most about these products performing because they are the most unlike uh, some of the development settings. Now, this is not necessarily the case in, in some kind of prospective trials like uh, uh, the diabetic retinopathy trials uh, across lots of different sites in Thailand, but to the extent that we've got uh, products developed in fairly fancy academic medical centers uh, or other places with relatively high resources, um, they're least likely to be generalizable to poor resource, uh, very different settings. And the validation is also gonna be quite difficult to do in those settings, um, whether that's just collecting the data for somebody else to try to validate or trying to do the validation uh, in situ. Thanks, Nicholson. And do you have thoughts, you know, Chuck asks in chat, um, you know, FDA's approach around, you know, focus on process rather than the actual, you know, validation results. Any thoughts you have on, you know, kind of ways the FDA is, in particular in the U.S., is thinking about regulating uh, some of these kinds of models or technologies? Yeah, so I think here about FDA, I think this is mostly a reference to FDA's pre-certification program, which is right now a pilot. It's unclear whether FDA actually has the authority to do this, but um, they've never been particularly squeamish about figuring out that they can do something and then figuring out whether they have the authority uh, later. Um, I like this approach, like in terms of thinking about trying to uh, uh, make sure that we have some way of trying to deal with the, the model evolution problem that was built up earlier. Uh, and, and your points on that as well, Karen Deep, like questions of how do I validate the approach rather than the very specific model since the model is um, A, potentially likely to be outdated as we have data drift and population shifts and things like that, and, and B, slightly different, at least potentially in different contexts. So building in some way for uh, a shift, I think is probably useful. And this is gonna be tough to do on a, on a version by version approach. Again, the thing that for me strikes me as potentially challenging here, I guess not again, but uh, in the US at least, lots and lots of models um, that are being used and deployed right now, um, uh, don't go through the FDA process at all. So when you got this paradigm case of, uh, you know, these couple hundred things that are you know, FDA cleared, but tons of products that are in use in healthcare right now, you know, don't go F through FDA because they're developed in a house or developed through electronic health records vendors and just FDA doesn't see them. So uh, I think FDA is probably taking the right approach, but uh, what it sees is a pretty limited set uh, of the, the overall space of uh, AI being used in health, uh, at least so far. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask two final questions to both of you. Um, I know we're, we're short on time and then we'll close things up. W one question I have is around, uh, you know, AI literacy among health professionals and kind of, you know, I think both of you are clinicians who, you know, are quite literate in this space. Um, and, you know, you interface both with folks on the machine learning AI side of things. And you probably also interface with folks on the clinical side of things. Um, how do we get more copies of you in the health system? Or what is it that we need to be able to actually have impact? Because you need to be able to speak the same language as you know, the clinical folks on the other end to actually get this stuff implemented. Um. I think to, one of the things that I think is going to be really important is like democratization of uh, kind of knowledge around some of the just basic concepts. Um, taking away like like a kind of what I would describe as a kind of code free, maths free understanding of just some basic principles. Because to me, there's a lot that we already learn it as kind of physician scientists, like many of us who've gone down any kind of academic track, we get exposed already to concepts around how to evaluate things rigorously and what to watch out for and so on. 
And I think several of those things apply equally to AI. It's just that there are some additional bits and pieces that, you know, in the same way that we learn about some of these things at medical school, or at least we're supposed to, hopefully we certainly should. And then perhaps the next layer of things could be in the postgraduate level of education, you know, like when you go in down the specialty, in those specialties, there's often a chance to learn specific aspects of relevant technologies like in postgraduate surgical training, you learn all about, you know, different suture materials and that kind of thing. Also, when it comes to imaging, you learn actually a lot about like the difference between angiography, direct angiography, CT, CO2 angiography, you have to learn these things. You learn about the tensile strengths of different metals and fabrics and stent grafts and when they fail. And I think the same thing needs to be done for AI. Like if it turns out actually that let's imagine aneurysm screening in the future is done with, you know, an array of commercial devices, then I think there has to be an appropriate level of education about the strengths, the weaknesses, the objective function, the learning objective, the types of evidence, you know, the reporting standards. That I think that's going to have to become a uh, routine um, and hopefully already is. Yeah, I think I agree with Alan as well. I think there's a certain degree of kind of building blocks knowledge that every clinician should have. So, you know, coming from a specialty where, uh, you know, most medical students do uh, like one week of ophthalmology in their training. But the one thing that I would love every clinician to be able to do is check for relevant rel relative afferent pupillary defect. And so, so trying to demarcate some of those things where, it's really critical to decision making and then cutting out some of the noise and some of the aspects of machine learning, which are interesting and I think uh, useful to get a conceptual understanding of, but actually you can kind of learn it, forget it and, you know, keep it at the back of your brain somewhere would be really helpful. But I think also I would also advocate for um, health institutions having dedicated teams with that expertise, um, because I think there's really a need for like a centralized institutional oversight of these algorithms and I think within those teams you need clinicians that have a really detailed understanding of health informatics of data of health data research uh, AI uh, who can kind of drop into multiple different medical specialties to to help those clinical teams um, provide oversight of algorithms and I think that's a really big role that some a small set of clinicians will need to take on in the future. Thanks. And uh, I think if uh, I'm not going to ask a second question, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, Dr. Wollescroft, if yeah, I think you unmuted. So I know Cornelius James was here, but I think he had to step out. Um, but you recently had a JAMA viewpoint paper on preparing clinicians for a clinical world influenced by AI. Uh, any thoughts that, that you'd like to share kind of from your experience as a uh, dean of the medical school and a medical educator? Uh, I think the point that was just made that it is imperative that this technology become integrated uh, depending upon uh, the discipline, but also as a baseline for all medical students uh, really is, is a very important point. So I agree totally, uh, just like in the past, uh, we eliminated technologies that were no longer relevant and replaced them with new ones. Uh, this is something that should be part of medical education in my opinion and then be built upon, uh, depending upon your postgraduate training uh, and the field that you're in, and whether you're gonna be using diagnostic, prognostic, et cetera, uh, different AI programs. Thank you so much. So I think on that note, I wanted to thank the speakers for their wonderful presentations. And I think your engagement with um, you know, the uh, questions really, really learned a lot from you. Um, uh, there was a post-event survey. Uh, the link will become available to you as you exit the webinar. Please fill that out. We'd love to get your feedback so we can kind of continue to uh, evolve our collaboratory. A link to the webinar materials will be placed on the collaboratory website archive. Um, and we have a couple of upcoming events I just wanted to highlight. One is that there's a Learning Health Systems 101 workshop on May 10th. Um, then there is, a, a, if you're trying to set up a learning community, there is a workshop on operate, operationalizing of a learning community on June 14th. 
Um, and the next uh, collaborative collaboratory seminar series will be in June, um, and it'll be focused on kind of ethical, legal, social implications of a learning health system. And I think the specific topic is going to be restructuring health systems for uh, learning, building equity into the learning health system. And we've got a, a fantastic lineup of two speakers. So look forward to having you join us there. Thank you so much, everyone.